Welcome to the Dear NICU Mama podcast. This podcast is a safe place to connect with other NICU moms by listening to interviews with trauma-informed medical and maternal mental health experts, remarkable stories from the NICU, and intentional roundtable conversations. Our hope is that you feel like you're sitting across the table from another NICU sister and feel seen and validated in your experience. No matter where you are on your healing journey, this podcast is here to remind you that you are not alone. Welcome to the sisterhood. All right. Happy Wednesday, moms. We are so excited to be back with part two of Trisha's story. I selfishly have been eagerly awaiting this episode. After we ended part one, I was like, wait, I'm not done. (laughs) I want to keep hearing more. So we're really excited to be back. Aisha, how are you doing on this summer day? We're doing great. Very excited as well to continue to hear. I feel like, like you said, we were just getting into like the the meat of the of the episode, and so I'm excited yeah. to to continue. And I feel like it's gonna be there's gonna be a lot of good um, just uh, info and encouragement for um, not only NICU moms but also moms um, who are now medical moms as well, complex who have complex medical kiddos at home and navigating being home with with um, um, dealing with diagnoses and all these um, things that you don't necessarily expect um, once you're home from the NICU. So I think it's going to be a really awesome episode to, to kind of dive into that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and if you haven't listened to part one, we will make sure to take it in the show notes or else you can go back into the feed and find part one. But part one was all about Trisha's journey with her twin boys, Sam and Jack. They were twin to twin transfusion twins, had a very long um, medical journey in the NICU. And then right as we ended, we talked about coming home. (laughs) And so we really want to focus part two on life after NICU. And Trisha has so much vulnerability to share, but also just wisdom to share. Um, Trisha, welcome back to the podcast. I know I'm talking for you. I just, but, (laughs) but tell us again, how old your kiddos are, because you are a very seasoned mama. So you have a lot of wisdom to share. Well, maybe, but (laughs) I have, I think so. Thank you. So our twins are, they're 13 now. They will be 14 in November going into eighth grade. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sam and Jack, like Whoa. you said, yeah, it's crazy. Um, and then Eli, he is our uh, third child. Um, he is 11 and he'll be in sixth grade in the fall. And then Claire, our youngest, is nine and she'll be in third grade. So it's a, it's a full house, but it's they're kind <laughs> of at the point, it's like it's a little bit I have a lot of friends who have younger kids who are still like, you know, waking up through the night and go, it gets easier. I promise. (laughs) We sleep in now and it's, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and I remember you saying at one point in your previous episode, you were like, I love my life. Mm -hmm. Like, I love my life. I love where we are now. But it took a lot of work and fighting and advocacy to really get to this place that you are right now. And so I'm excited to just hear about your journey. And so maybe let's start right at coming home. Sure. The twins had, how long was their NICU stay? So Jack was three, just under three months, actually. He was always considered a feeder grower. Um, Mm -hmm. I want to say like just over 60 days, like 66 days. And um, Sam was just about four months. So Sam um, Sam ended up having to have a couple surgeries before he left the NICU, which obviously delayed coming home mm-hmm. um, due to the, we ta- chatted about his medical stuff, like sepsis, meningitis and all that. He acquired hydrocephalus and um, he had two VP shunt surgeries before coming home and it had a feeding too when he came home. Um, And so, yeah, when we, when we were asked by the NICU staff, you know, like we can keep waiting, we can, you know, work on his oral feeding skills and we'll, you know, bring in everyone that is at the hospital or you guys can go home. Maybe things will be better there. And it was a no brainer. Right. I mean, I already Mm -hmm. had Jack at home. Um, I was sick of bringing, I mean, the poor kid was not enjoying his infancy. He was having to come to the hospital all the time. And so we went home. And my husband's so funny. I mentioned that he's a physician. He refused to do the NG tube ever. He's like, nope. <laughs> I will that is your task. So I got trained and he's like, I mean, I know how to do it. I just, I won't do it. And it's, it's so funny. He's like, but it's your own kid. So I, here I am. My uh, English education degree really came in. 
I learned how to do the NG tube and it was great. We had home health care come in to um, do weight, weight checks, um, which was nice. We didn't have to go to the doctor. Um, but fee- let's just say it did not go according to plan, right? Mm-hmm. When we got home, it was not he just clearly couldn't do it. And mm-hmm. there's physiologically, he could not, it wasn't the NICU environment. It wasn't the stress of the, you know, not being with mom and dad all day. It was just, he was not capable of doing it. So we stuck mm-hmm. out, um, for a good year, we got feeding therapy involved. Um, I know Sanford locally has a feeding program now. Mm-hmm. We were in mm-hmm. Omaha and that is, um, they have a wonderful feeding Institute there too. And we just, you know, you can't, it is what it is. And so mm-hmm. after a year, um, year and a half, when he was a year and a half old, we got uh, a G2 placed. Mm-hmm. So that was funny enough. I mean, it was very freeing, mm-hmm. but he ended up having mm-hmm. like, um, he had eight surgeries. So um, wow. some surgeries, they obviously go into your brain, but they shunt it everything down to your stomach area. So his scarring was just extensive and mm-hmm. His gut motility was very slow, so he would have bouts of um, emesis. I feel like if you're a Nikki mom, you know what that is, right? The throwing up mm-hmm. if you're not a Nikki mom, the fancy word is emesis. And it was nonstop. And so overnight, mm-hmm. getting overnight feeds, and with an NG tube, we were getting tangled up in the overnight feeds. Mm-hmm. The G tube just allowed us a little bit more flexibility. But yeah, it was because of his feeding, it was very developmentally, he was very off track. I mean, he just, mm-hmm. everything revolved around nutrition. Um, so like tummy time, we literally, maybe he'd get like 20 minutes a day because otherwise he'd throw up and it's, Mm -hmm. you know, when you're getting 30 ounces over an hour and you're still throwing up, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. that was, that was a tough spot. Um, Mm -hmm. the doctor's telling us to do another surgery called a fundoplication, um, where it would just literally be impossible for him to throw up. Um, it's a very extensive surgery. We opted not to do it. Um, which I, I still think is the right call, but at the time I, it, yeah, we really it's struggled hard. with that because, yeah. mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Maybe if he hadn't had so many brain surgeries, it would have been a different story, but I'm like, we're not mm-hmm. under anesthesia again, just for this. Mm-hmm. So, um, that's where we were in our journey. Yeah. So about a year, he was 18 months old and we just, you know, started the therapies. We started all that stuff. Um, and then at 23 months, I welcomed our third child. So, <laughs> surprise. Surprise. Yay, Eli. And he was oh. just, I uh, I know we chatted briefly about like talking about maybe pregnancy after NICU mm-hmm. and after medical mm-hmm. stuff. And I can touch on that if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I do want to really quick ask is, yeah. so being that, Sam had so many medical complexities and things like that. I feel like one thing that we hear often in the community is you're so focused on just like getting through the next moment, through the next day that you it kind of prolongs the processing of your NICU journey and your NICU experience. Yep. And so for you, when did you feel like you really began to process everything that had happened you know, even through pregnancy, when you found out the twin to twin transfusion diagnosis, and then the NICU, I mean, when did you feel like you had the space and capacity to be like, whoa, we just went through that? Oh, that is such a good question. And I don't know, that didn't come till much later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Being Mm -hmm. being a medical mom and being in fight or flight constantly. Mm -hmm. I, you know, there were moments, I would say that bouts of just overwhelming grief would hit me. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. and I'd like, you know, go quote unquote, take a shower. I mean, I was in the shower just to sob and cry Mm -hmm, and not mm -hmm. let anyone see me. Um, I remember vividly, there was a moment when we were trying to teach Sam how to eat, like take a bottle. And I just, my husband was, you know, God bless him, but he was out just relaxing. I think his mom was visiting and he was just like chatting with mom about this and that. And I went out on the porch and I just screamed. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. And I, I just walked away and, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I think, you know, and that was probably Sam was maybe 14 months old Mm -hmm. and I just, it, and still, I still hadn't processed it. I Mm -hmm. hadn't, therapy was just a, absolutely not. That was not a, really mental health, I feel was not talked about as much back mm-hmm. then, but, um, 
no, I, um, if I hadn't been pregnant with Eli, it, I probably would have struggled even more. I think I Mm. really, I was nervous the whole pregnancy, but, um, he gave me something to like, look forward to. Mm -hmm. Right. And Mm -hmm. so I was able to kind of channel my grief and my frustration and what I experienced into the new pregnancy, but I struggled for a very long time. I mean, until Sam was probably diagnosed, which we can talk about. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, there's still flashes that I have and there's still conversations that we had in the NICU that like mm-hmm. just got me a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. I remember um, actually driving just to a doctor's appointment where we lived in town. We, um, we didn't have to take the same route that we took once we had had the twins, right? So when I was pregnant with the twins, we traveled west. And now where we were living, I would have to travel east. And so I very rarely drove the same route. Well, one day I, I did, like I was out there and I took that same route and I had to pull off on the interstate. I was sobbing so bad. <laughs> I don't wish that on anybody. And it was, there was nothing, there was no sound. There was no, it was just that drive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I hadn't done that in probably two years. And I just, I had to pull over on the side of the road and just sob for a little bit. And then, you know, you go home and I'm sure Adam, how was your day? And it's great. It was great. And, I just <laughs> it, you know? yeah. and he probably didn't even know that that happened until mm-hmm. who knows a couple of years later. Um, yeah. So all that to say, like, whenever you process it is normal. Mm-hmm, um, everyone's mm-hmm. story is different. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wild journey. So it yeah. makes sense. Well, I think that's honestly the most validating answer mm-hmm. because I think as NICU moms, we, or as moms in general, or people, I don't even know, but you want kind of like this, okay, I will process this at this point and then I'll get over it and then I'll move to the next thing and then I'll check it off my box. Yep. And anytime that we ask that question, it's always where I'm still processing it yep. or I processed it much later. And while that can be sometimes a frustrating answer to hear when you're in the trenches, it's also the most validating because you're like, okay, I'm not making this up. I'm not crazy. Right. You know, like it makes sense that I'm not able to process my experience in the middle of my son's feeding journey or right. you know, in his medical complex journey. Yep. Um, and one question I want to ask when you hear about the twin relationship you see like the iconic twin relationships in the movies or you hear about this like they're you know like you mentioned they're on the same timeline and they kind of like feed into each other's success and you know um I wonder with having twins who maybe were on very significantly different developmental um journeys and medical journeys how was it for you as a twin mom to see their relationship grow and you know, really to provide validation for other twin moms who aren't having that traditional twin journey that they envisioned and also have seen maybe on in the movies or in the TV shows. I'd If you feel comfortable, I'd love to just hear your heart on that. Yeah. And I, I'm super honest about this in that that is something that is, it's very painful mm-hmm. for me to mm-hmm. even talk about um, because I think now looking back, there's so many things I wish I had done differently, but when you're in it, you don't, you don't know what to do. And yeah, so when yeah. I, Jack, I, I mean, I love that boy so much, but he was, I mean, for all intents and purposes, he was a bit dismissed as a baby, as an infant. And like, and I knew it in the moment, I, but I was just like, what am I supposed to do? You know, and he mm-hmm. wanted to be held. And I was like, a very young mom whose husband was never home and had no family. And I physically, like I, when I was in it deep with Sam, I mean, I would be feeding him, attempting to solve his feeding problems. I would be then washing his feeding Mm -hmm. tube. I'd be setting up the feeding tube. I mean, if Jack and I had a moment to play, um, Mm -hmm. it, I mean, Murphy's law, right. Something would go on with like a beep would happen with Sam or he'd get tangled Mm -hmm. and, I think that as a mom was so hard for me even then. And still when I talk about it is incredibly hard. Um, Mm -hmm. And then as far as the twin thing goes, I, there are so many innate twin things that Mm -hmm. will still be there. Like, you know, and I worried about that too, but I remember every time we brought Jack to the NICU to visit Sam, we put them in the same thing. And I mean, within seconds, and Sam was a bundle of wires and cords and everything. And 
they would somehow find each other. And I, oh. right. Like we still had it and yeah. we had it in a yeah. different way. Um, yeah. when it came time to like, when Jack started crawling, I would, I mean, he, it was never very far. It was so funny. He was never, I don't want to say Sam held him back. Cause that's not what I'm trying to say, but no, I yeah. think had they been two adventurous boys together, it would have been a whole different journey for both of them. Right. But Jack was just a little more cautious and he was mm. a little more, you know, say we had an entire main level to roam around. He would never leave that little area where Sam was. Mm. And, oh, oh yeah. right. And it's just like, those things get to me. And even now they're very different people, but they still prefer each other over anyone else. Um, yeah. We still, and like, that's the thing is twins. It's, you read about it, you, you see movies on it. And it's like, there, there's something that medical stuff still doesn't take away. It just changes it a little. Yeah. It is yeah, the most absolutely. fascinating thing I've ever witnessed. And I mean, to be totally transparent, we were only going to have two kids. And then I'm like, no, nope, I, <laughs> I can't end on um, a, a sad journey. So then I'm like, let's have a third. And then I, I felt like he would be missing out on something. So then we had a fourth. <laughs> <laughs> We're insane. Well, we should have the two, but no, I'm kidding. But I, um, yeah. So I, I, I will say that regardless of the medical complexities of one or both, you will have your twin experience. It will just yeah. be unique, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I want to, I want to definitely dive into like how it felt to make that decision to, to, um, get pregnant again and have another. Yeah. So how, how was it, um, for you to decide, like, I, I'm ready to, to try again. You know, your first experience did not go as planned, right? Yeah. It was, it was very, very, um, scary. And so how did you feel, um, making that decision as a family? Was it easy? Um, what were your I emotions? Think, you know, having a third, I wouldn't say we debated a long time. It was something I, I expressed to Adam and, and him to me as well. Like how we just, it started as a conversation. Like, I just wish this wasn't my story. I just wish like any time I thought about being pregnant or thought about the birth, right? Because everything was traumatic. It was like, mm -hmm. and almost even like the twin diagnosis at like seven weeks, it's just, it was so chaotic and up and down the whole time. And I go, I just, finally, we were like, I just can't have it end here. Like, this isn't, this is like a semicolon, right? And I need a, mm -hmm. I need to continue on and try. And so we just, you know, we were, we're thankful that we were able to get pregnant pretty quickly. I mean, they're, they're close in age. And, um, I was an anxious ball of nerves the entire mm -hmm. time. And I was so grateful. So my, um, ob -GYN, just did not my MFM, my ob -GYN did recommend, she's like, just based on what happened with the twins, let's make sure we get you into maternal fetal medicine mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Like there was, you know, I think just to honestly give me peace of mind, um, mm -hmm. and MFM, the same doc just looked me over and was like, perfect, you know, healthy. And even that I was like, okay, yay, but okay. Why am I still so anxious? You know? And, mm -hmm. um, it last, it, I remember when I was pregnant, I was like, I'm never going to complain about being pregnant for so long. <laughs> and I'll tell you what I did. I did complain about being pregnant. <laughs> if I just remember being like, I would never complain about getting big and being, I'm like, no, I do. And that, that felt almost <laughs> like I was cheating on my first pregnancy. Right. And then I was like, I'm being a hypocrite. And so even that was still not normal. And, mm -hmm. um, but gosh, I'll tell you what, when Eli was born and he was 41 weeks, so he's like, I'll give you an extra <laughs> week, mom. Okay. Um, and he was a failed VBAC. So we tried to do a VBAC, failed miserably. He just, he was very comfy in there. <laughs> so, you know, it was great. And I would say that the birth story that we have with him is so beautiful. Like it was, I, um, I had, oh my gosh, I know there's a name for it, but the C-section, it was just like a, like he immediately came on me and mm -hmm. like, it was just, it was what I needed. It healed my heart a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then we decided to have a fourth and that, um, I had a miscarriage in between, um, 
we really ended up liking having them close in age, funny enough. Mm -hmm. Um, It was very hard. I should back up when, when Eli was born, Sam was still not walking. So Mm -hmm. they were, they're 23 months apart. And so Jack was a walker. Sam was, I would, I wouldn't say he was nowhere near, but he was, he definitely was not able to walk yet. And so I was, Mm -hmm. had a newborn, a toddler who couldn't walk. And then a toddler who by that time, Jack was like, I'm okay running away now, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so that was, that was very challenging. Mm -hmm. I mean, I joke, I'm like, well, my baby weight fell off in like a day because it was like, (laughs) just running around, running around and lifting like Sam and Eli and going up and down the stairs. And, um, so that was, Mm -hmm. it was kind of chaotic fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that was, it was a lot. And so, um, but yeah, between Eli and Claire had a miscarriage And we were kind of up in the air. And then we realized like when I had a miscarriage, how we were so devastated that I'm like, we clearly really need a fourth, Mm -hmm. right? And so we had had our daughter. And are you you guys ready for me to talk about that? Yeah, let's go into it. Yep. (laughs) So um, our daughter, once again, um, when we found out we were pregnant, we actually, I'm trying to remember, we we had like my same OB-GYN doc, and I opted. So at the time, and medical terms are failing me. I um, I had a blood test at 16 weeks, and now I know mm-hmm. you can test a lot earlier. But mm-hmm. even like back then, it was the science was not there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, she, yeah. she said you can do this. I think eight weeks, maybe. Correct me if I'm wrong, but she's like the science still doesn't really back it up. Maybe, and I'm like, oh god, no. Like I need concrete evidence. <laughs> so we waited till 16 weeks to do the blood test um, to test for abnormalities, and. Um, we, she called me and, um, I was 30 at the time, called me and said, you know, there is a slight, everything looks good. There is a slight elevation for maybe having down syndrome. But also when I look at that, like you're also 30 now. So your age probably plays a role in that. Um, nothing to worry about. Like, why don't you come in for, um, an ultrasound again? So, We did. And she goes, yeah, let's just refer you to maternal fetal medicine because, you know, the only way to confirm Down syndrome is an amnio. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm not going to do that. So, and the reason being, I mean, and Adam and I go back and forth as to whether or not we should have just confirmed. I don't know. Some days I'm like, I wish I had prepared because regardless, I, I was anxious about it then the entire time. Mm -hmm. So we opted not to do an amnio. I went to MFM and he, um, it a more intense, scan, a more, you know, intense scan than OB had had and was looking for all the markers of Down syndrome, found none. And, you know, kind of joked us like, she's, you know, we knew it was a girl. He told us it was a girl. She's like, you're just, she's pretty, like, she's small, but you know, even Eli was kind of small and now he's in the 99th percentile. Right. So she's sure, like, yeah. you just maybe make small babies and that's okay. Um, and it was so wild and I've talked about this before, but after that appointment, I, a part of me knew, even though he had told me, no, there's, it, I don't see any indication of down syndrome. I was like, I don't, I don't know what it is. Like I just, and again, it was maybe that just uneasy feeling of, I don't know. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to lean into who it is and versus it's not. And, um, in the next couple of weeks, I ended up seeing so many people with Down syndrome, like that I had mm-hmm. never seen before at Costco, at Target, at the park, little kids with Down syndrome. And I'm like, okay, something's. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, um, fast forward, she was a small baby. Um, so my OB wanted to do just like um, the non stress tests and stuff. And she ended up like around 36 weeks, just not doing great. So we added a frequent, like up the frequency. Um, and then at th- it was 30, she was born at 37 and two. So at 37 and one, she just, she failed it miserably. She mm-hmm. failed so that we had to do a BPP. And I, at that, I had three kids at home. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what am I going to do with my boys? Mm-hmm. So God bless my sister. She was a nurse by then and she drove down. And so they, they said, you have to have the, within 24 hours, she has, you have to have this baby. So my sister, um, 
drove down and took care of the three boys and we became parents um, to a little girl. And my, so Adam obviously was in there and um, it was funny. It was just a little different than Eli. So mm-hmm. it was, it, and I felt it and, but I, but again, in my mind, I was trying to rationalize like, oh, I think they're just confirming she doesn't have anything wrong with her. They're confirming because she's so small, right? Like she went on my chest mm-hmm. and then she was kind of taken away pretty quickly. Like mm-hmm. nothing was wrong. It was just like, okay, well, we got to clean the baby up and they know what to say, right? Mm-hmm. They know what to say. So they're not totally panicking. But um, my husband said, he's like, I knew the minute they put her down because they, they looked at her toes mm-hmm. and characteristics of Down syndrome. I mean, if you're listening and you have a child, you know what they are. I mean, there's like a big gap between the first toe and second toe. There's a line on their palm typically. And these are all, you know, just very mm-hmm. common mm-hmm. features. Not everyone has them. Eyes are, you know, almond shaped, low set ears, things like that. And they were doing like, obviously checking to make sure she was okay. But all these extra things that they were looking at. And Adam's like, I just knew like mm-hmm. the minute mm-hmm. the, they kind of glanced at each other, like the doctor and the nurse. Mm-hmm. So I did it. I was blissfully ignorant thinking <laughs> they would have said announced it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the moment she came out. The moment she came out, they, just, they would have known. There would have been a tag. I have it. <laughs> it. It doesn't work like that. Oh. So, uh, oh my gosh. So they were wheeling me out of re- Oh, and so I had my tubes tied mm-hmm. during this surgery. So I just, we knew we were done at four. I mean, done. So I had mm-hmm. my tubes tied and... Um, so it took a little bit longer and, you know, they, it's such a great surgery when you're out. So, I mean, I was actually able to hold her, Adam was holding her. And as they were wheeling me though, out to like recovery, my doctor said, Hey, Trish, gorgeous girl. And this is, if you are a physician listening, this is how you handle a birth diagnosis. She is beautiful. She is incredible, but there are some features of Down syndrome. So I do think we need to do, um, some further testing and, I don't know how you break that new, and it, oh, sorry. I, um, I think, you know, and I, I also like, I lived through trauma with the twins so severe. And now I was like, again, like that can't mm-hmm. be, that's not my story. Like this was supposed to be Eli's buddy. Like this mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. you know, and my only girl. And like, mm-hmm. I think, and it's again, you, in hindsight, all those feelings are valid that I had the absolute sadness, but mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. I joke. I'm like, I'd take 10 of her now. I would, I'd take 10. Mm. Uh, But the way the doctor said it was so gentle and Mm. just so reassuring, like kids with down syndrome and like, she knew the lingo, right? Like she, she had clearly, she had clearly like gotten some training or like had taken it upon herself to really look into how to deliver a diagnosis. And Mm. what I hear that's definitely not common. So I will forever be grateful for that. But I, um, in that moment though, also I was furious with my maternal fetal doc. I was furious Mm -hmm. and it's so weird now, but I was like, he told me it was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And like, you can't tell, right? Like, again, there's, he's, they're not, they're not God. Like they don't (laughs) know everything. They're still, it's, you can't, it's an ultrasound. It's not a definitive, like, and again, like if it was an amnio, maybe we should have, but whatever. It was, it was very hard. Um, mm-hmm. I loved her so deeply, but mm-hmm. again, a Down syndrome diagnosis. And then after having the twins and still like Sam still had a feeding tube, Sam was still barely talking. Like, yeah, I just thought, how can I do this? And, um, you know, doctors get so little training on Down syndrome. I remember asking Adam, like, well, what does that mean? Like what extra stuff? But I was so worried she'd have feeding troubles. And he goes, I think it's, we have to make sure her heart's okay. I'm like, oh, okay. So the doctors, you know, they did a blood test, um, to confirm the diagnosis, which would take a couple days. And then in the meantime, um, at the hospital, they did an ultrasound on her heart or echo. And, um, yeah, she did. She had a heart defect, so which I was then even more just mm-hmm. devastated, right? Like mm-hmm. they told me, you know, typically surgery happens by six months. Like I, I can't do another kid in like another surgery mm-hmm. kid. And, mm-hmm. um, 
it was, I didn't, I didn't know how to tell people either. So we had spent, you know, the twins were, oh my gosh, four and a half when she was born. And we'd spent four and a half years of people being like, oh, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you, and I'm like, now what are people going to say? You know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. So Adam's, my sister was there, obviously. And then Adam's parents called. And so those were the first three people we told. And so my sister, she, she's so sweet. She, at the, she's very calm. Like she'd be like the calm to my insanity. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> she goes, Oh, I was, I said, Krista, it looks like they told me she might have Down syndrome. And she goes, Oh, I, you know, I could, yeah. How'd that go? How are you feeling about that? And she just, okay, you know, well, have they done an echo? And she was just so calm and like, just knew mm-hmm. what to say. And Adam told his parents and I, I was like, how do I tell mom and dad? Mm-hmm. And especially with what my dad had gone through with me and the twins, I was like, I don't know what to do. So she's like, well, mm-hmm. I can help call them. And I go, no, let me. So we FaceTime them. And I, I just, I told, I'm like, they think she has Down syndrome. And like, that's all I could get out. And I, mm-hmm. I, I think they just, you know, they messaged, they texted me later and a, Okay. Save the text messages, people. That's the other thing that I wish I had done. Like take all the screenshots, send them to your, I don't know. I wish I had saved what they had said. Mm -hmm. Like it was just Mm -hmm. like, we love her. We love you. It was nothing like, I'm sorry. There was no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I didn't, now I realize how much words like say hearing, I'm sorry. I, one of my friends did say, I'm sorry. And I had like a visceral reaction to like, I wanted to correct her and be like, why are you sorry? Mm-hmm. Like, don't say that. Mm-hmm. And you know, now I'm like, no, definitely don't ever say I'm sorry to someone who gets a diagnosis like that. All I wanted to hear was she is beautiful. Oh my gosh. Like she mm-hmm. looks just like you, or she looks just like Eli, mm-hmm. or you know, we wanted to, we want to hear all the typical things because mm-hmm. we know what's mm-hmm. coming. is not typical. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it was a pretty devastating like month. I won't lie. And she was Mm -hmm. a great, great eater. She was a great baby. I never cried. I mean, my God, (laughs) best little girl. And, um, you know, but the medical stuff started right away and going and testing certain levels that kids with Down syndrome are at risk for and the heart stuff. And we were lucky enough that actually her heart didn't need to be operated on right away. So Mm -hmm. that was... Mm -hmm that was a blessing in disguise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I just am so thankful for your honesty in speaking into this Mm -hmm. and speaking about these feelings that you were having and, and actually verbalizing it because I do think that um, it is so common to feel guilt when your feelings and your emotions don't match what whatever expectation of what you should be feeling in a moment like that. Um, There is no rules on how you should be feeling. And so to be honest and to say the things that um, are hard to say, but I think give permission for yourself and then anyone else who might be going through something similar to say, oh my gosh, I'm not a horrible person or I'm not a monster for having these very natural um, human responses to hard things that happen. Right. Um, and so I just am so grateful for that because I think that, um, it does, it just allows for, for moms listening to, to give themselves a little bit of grace when maybe they weren't giving themselves grace, um, for having these very conflicting emotions, right. Being grateful for healthy babies and, upset and angry at hard diagnoses and, and, and navigating all of that, you know, like you can have both of them. And, um, I wanted to see if you could maybe, cause it seems like it comes with a layer of finally embracing and accepting your reality, even though you may not love it. Um, even though it's hard. Um, my question is kind of in the realm of, How did you do that? How was, um, and there may not be an answer to that. How, how did you finally, or when was the moment you finally said, I'm going to accept my story for, for all of it, right? The beautiful, the hard. 
so that I would say, um, gosh, that I feel like I finally learned to accept it once things had settled down with Claire. I, I was older by then and I, Mm -hmm. um, I think I had let go of my feelings of just, I mean, this sounds terrible, but I had, I had to let go of my feelings of what everyone else was thinking. Mm -hmm. And Right. I mean, that is such a natural thing to feel no matter what as a new mom. Um, and then as a young female and as just someone who's, I mean, a little bit alone and was, I, I wanted validation from everyone that I was doing it right and doing it well, but there's no rule book for this. Mm-hmm. And once I realized that, like, fine, you know, it, this is just, this is gonna be my story and I'm going to own it. And mm-hmm. like, this mm-hmm. is, I, I, I'm sarcastic and I, I, I say things that other people are thinking. (laughs) I just like, I had to own it. And I think that was Mm -hmm. when I started to really realize either in person, when I would have conversations with therapists or I would have conversations with like friends whose children were going through things as well, just different things. And, um, reading, by, you know, by when Claire was born, like Facebook or groups were starting to happen. Um, when I was honest, I probably ruffled a few feathers, but like the more, more, it's like, thank you for saying that. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you know what, if I'm not Trisha, if I, I got to let go of just the like feeling of just being mama four and being this, um, pillar of strength. And if I just admit like, God, dang it. Some days are really hard. Some days Mm -hmm. I don't want to be here. And some days I want to run away. And then there's other days where I literally don't want to leave my kid's side, you know? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. when I started to just earn that, like earn back that sense of, I don't know, empowerment in myself, Mm -hmm. it just, that was when I became okay with my story. Mm -hmm. And like, Mm -hmm. and that's, the story just, it's, it, it just started there, right? Like my, mm-hmm. it's been a story since pregnancy with the twins and uh, mm-hmm. I've owned it ever since. And I think too, there's things that, there's controversial things in all of our worlds. Um, and you guys, I mean, right? Like not only in special needs moms know this well, but like even in the autism world, it's like, there's a divide in the down syndrome world. There's a divide. And like, no one told me that that was going to happen. No one told me that that was a Mm -hmm. thing. So when I found that out, instead of feeling, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it was just being like, you have to pick what your role is going to be as a special Mm -hmm. needs mom Mm -hmm. and just rock it. Mm -hmm. I have. And I, um, I think just by sharing my journey, I've chosen to share the highs and the lows. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's helped me a lot. Like that's really helped me accept, um, everything. Yeah. Well, and I hear, no, well, and I hear what I hear is like, I think a lot of the times as moms or even with our kids, like we tie like our identity to X and Y or, you know, a diagnosis or a, um, a a part of our story. Like we tie our identities to that. And I, I see that you don't tie your identity to that, right? Like your identity, you are you, Jack and Sam and Eli and Claire, they are them regardless of whatever um, they go through, whatever they live, whatever they, whatever diagnosis they receive, like they're them outside of that. And you are you outside of that. And that is, I feel like when I hear you, I hear like that is liberating, right? Because no matter what happens, you guys in essence are still who you are, right? so that's really beautiful. Yep. <clears throat> I I love that you said that because I think right in the early stages, I remember feeling a little bit selfish, just not, I mean, I wasn't going out and doing massages. Or, I was just finding myself mm-hmm. and finding my identity. And even that felt a little selfish. And I'm like, no, you know what? That is, I had to look at it as an empowerment and an empowering feeling mm-hmm. and versus, but it felt weird trying to be like, no, I'm I remember correcting a doctor one time and just finally being like old <laughs> enough to do it. And he says, okay, so mom, what do you think? And I'm like, well, my name's Trisha. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, and like, and it wasn't yeah. like a new doctor's. I'm like, we've met like 12 times. Right. Well, mom, what do you, 
know what? My name's Trisha. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> I, this is what I think, but again, yeah. you're the, it's yeah. so, you know, and I, um, if I, if being like self-deprecating about the journey too, I mean, there's mistakes that happen. And if I have to make fun of myself and I kind of have to make fun <laughs> of my kids, right? Well, and I think to take on to that, I think what that also, because in our last episode, you talked about relationships that you've gained yeah. since becoming a medical mom, since your NICU journey and all these things. And I think that can sometimes only happen when we're willing to share a little bit yeah. of that role. And so sometimes the the most beautiful thing about investing in yourself is, okay, I'm going to invest in myself and that also allows me to invite this other therapist or other person who has a completely different perspective on my family. And now I also get that relationship. Like the opening up of ourselves also allows us to have these new relationships that we would have never had had it just been, this is all I am. This is all I will ever be. You know what I'm trying to say? I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. I would. Yeah. I've been lucky to form relationships with almost every therapist I've had and same with the physicians. And it, I don't know that that would have happened had I just come in with like a list of questions and Mm -hmm. like, let's get to this. And, you know, I, let's humanize it a little bit. And that's kind of when I talk to new moms, new medical moms, especially, I'm like, you have to show them you, and you have to remind them that you have, I remember a therapy plan that was prescribed for Sam one time. And I was like, absolutely not. I have four, (laughs) you know, and like, had I not been, I want to say I was bold, but I was like, don't you were yeah. telling you I have four kids like this isn't mm-hmm. gonna happen and mm-hmm. you know you have to remind them that it, you are not just Sam's mom you are Trisha with and I didn't I wasn't working that you, if you have a job if you have I mean, <laughs> commitment, oh my gosh you have to remind people of that mm-hmm. yeah, yeah absolutely well one thing that we I know we're getting close to time here but one thing that uh we really wanted to touch on as we kind of like the last 10 minutes of the episode yeah. is you wrote a post on, I think it was your Inclusion Inc. page, which yeah. we'll make sure to talk about um, at the end here. But it was all about navigating summers. And I honestly had not thought of this until you had posted it. And I was like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. And so we would love, as we kind of close out this episode, to talk just a little bit about what you shared in that post. And a lot of it was just the kind of reality that maybe in the summer or in the school year you have more of those support systems in place you have the pairs you have the IEPs you have the specialized teachers throughout your child's school year and then summer happens and all of a sudden you wear all the hats yeah. and it can be really overwhelming um and sometimes as a medical mom you wrote that summers feel really daunting instead of exciting yeah. And so I would love for you to share about that, to really just affirm the other medical moms in our community who might be feeling a little bit of that daunting experience yep. and how you navigate summers now as a mom who's 14 years, almost 14 years yep. into her medical complex journey. Yeah. I would say every May I get a little angsty and, you know, it's, I know it's coming. Um, the routine of the school year is so for all kids, right? And I think they thrive with routine. Um, I know mm-hmm. as adults, we thrive with routine. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. love to mix it up with a few things. But when it comes to our kids, especially with like medical needs or, you know, their IEPs are pretty specific. When summer happens, I mean, it's poof out the window. And it's it's not only is routine disrupted, but like you're taking away a lot of peer support. Um mm-hmm. I, I love my, my son, Sam, who has autism. Um, he's incredible and it's, he's never cared about, and we'll be frank, he doesn't have any, any friends. Um, but at school he has peers who care about him. And like, Mm -hmm. as a mom, that is just, that's, that's all I need. I, that's Mm -hmm. important. And so in the summer, he's, he has summer school a couple hours in the morning, but then afterwards it's, he's bored and then boredom leads to destruction, leads to chaos. Um, His learning, you know, goes out the window. Same with Claire. So Claire is, you know, has an IEP and you, you know, her para, she's obsessed with her para. She took away a lot of these adults that these kids just tend to not rely on, but like really connect with and the kids Mm -hmm. and summer is fantastic. But even when you enroll them in camps, you have to teach 
these camp counselors like, okay, so Mm -hmm. he has, you know, when Sam was young, I was like, he has a feeding tube and it's okay. Um, He, he won't use it at camp obviously, but he probably won't eat anything. So if you see him just kind of like, you know, I remember, and just having to explain that felt like I was burying my soul all over again. I'm like, I have to Mm -hmm. explain this to someone new every time. And Mm-hmm. With Claire, it's she's in summer camps, but her speech is hard to understand. So I have to say, you know, this if you have questions, this is what she means. And it's being the therapist and the tutor and the teacher as a mom is so exhausting. Mm-hmm. And then when you have kids who struggle without a routine, it's it's its own other level of exhaustion because you're trying to make summer memorable for your for your child and for your other children was trying to just like hang on. And that's not to say we don't love summer. We do. It's just very yeah. different from like mm-hmm. what my summer was. Right. And mm-hmm. one, one thing I have to do most summers is kind of log off of social media. And that took mm-hmm. me a long time to realize like why it was affecting me so much, but, and this is, I'll be totally transparent and honest. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, clearly I always am. Um, <laughs> You know, just little things like I'll see Claire's classmates like hanging out on because I'm friends with their mom on social media and like she's not there. She's not invited. Mm. And then I'll look out my front window and I'll see all these little kids her age running around on bikes and my daughter is in the backyard. Like, right, mm. and no one's inviting her. And it's it took me a long time to um be okay. I'm not, I don't love it. It still breaks mm-hmm. my heart. Um, but I've had to kind of reframe my thinking to be like, you know what? It's not that they don't want her. It's that they know she can't keep up and they know that, you know, she has a tendency to just kind of do her own thing. And maybe the parents feel uncomfortable having her over because they're worried that, you know, that they'll need to do something extra. And when I tell myself those things, it makes me feel better but it Mm -hmm. doesn't take away the sadness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's Mm -hmm. something that is important for other moms to know that like that, that really doesn't go away. And as much as I'm like inclusion, inclusion, and I was talking about this thing, like everyone I know want is pro inclusion. Everyone is like, yes, we love what you're doing. And we love that you advocate for inclusion. And I'm like, well, could you invite me out for like a cocktail then, you know, and Mm -hmm. yeah, could you invite Claire over for a little, you know, a little hangout and, Mm -hmm. um, those are just things that we have to deal with. And I, Mm -hmm. I'm not here to say this is the answer. I'm here to say it's normal and like, let commiserate with me because it's hard and like, it's, it's lonely, but it's like how you deal with that, that will kind of, I guess, can alter the trajectory of what you do with your life. Right. Like I'm, I'm, I will say it like, I'm kind of a lonely person and it's okay. But like, I have found other hobbies. I'm a writer. I love writing. I love baking. I love cooking. And I have a great group of like best friends that I can Mm -hmm. talk to, but it's okay if your life doesn't look like social media, especially in the Mm -hmm. summer, right? Because Mm -hmm. my son can't handle fireworks. So we, we are in the basement on the 4th of July and we're Mm -hmm. not at the lake because he can't, that would be so overwhelming for him. And like, again, I'm not here to say this is the answer and this is how you fix it. I'm based, I'm here to be like, this Mm -hmm. is normal and find your people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's such an affirming reminder. Thank you so much. I just appreciate your transparency and vulnerability. And I know on our last episode, it was really like vulnerable to talk about the friendships piece, but it resonated the most Mm -hmm. with moms. Like, oh my gosh, like I have also lost friendships or didn't even realize how much it affected me six years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think with this topic, it's kind of the same thing of like, it's really vulnerable to share about, but in turn, it makes other moms feel seen and heard and validated. And so on that note, then you started this remarkable company called Inclusion Inc. So can you just share a little bit with us about that and then how moms can connect with it? Sure. You bet. So this kind of came about when I jokingly said, what am I going to do with my life? Right. And I, (laughs) I, um, I love and wear my role as special needs mom of two proudly. And I, um, in the community and even beyond, I've just been contacted. I mean, I get contacted daily from, you know, like friends whose, um, 
sister is going to have a child with Down syndrome or their, you know, their nephew is diagnosed with autism and just like, how can you help? And I, I have all these, like, it was funny. I had all these like notes saved in my phone or just like little blog posts that I've written over time for various, for various sites. And I just, I, I, I wanted a place where like moms, let's be honest, mostly moms, but caregivers could go where it's like a one-stop shop, right? So like mm-hmm. advocating for your child in a medical setting, advocating for your child in the education setting, how to foster inclusion within schools, within medical offices. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that, it has been so fun for me to just hear what people need and kind mm-hmm. of come up with something. Um, a lot of times it's like, how do I ask for help? And it's like, okay, well, mm-hmm here, this is, this is, these are tools. These are tricks of what mm-hmm. to say. Um, I'm happy to help. My, my one thing that I absolutely love other than helping moms is like going in and talking to medical professionals and educators mm-hmm. about inclusion. Mm-hmm. And like, it is coming from the horse's mouth. It is coming from someone who is like, this is how you need to talk about it. It's not coming from like google.com. <laughs> it's like how, you know, for example, a pediatrician, okay, you obviously have a thousand hats and a thousand roles to play, but like, how can you better serve a special needs family, right? What does that mm-hmm. look like? Let me help you. Um, you know, it, it's just been so fun to really engage people in this way about promoting mm-hmm. inclusion, but also advocating in a way mm-hmm. that my favorite phrase is like, be an advocate, not an adversary, and how to walk into those meetings and be like, let's work together, not mm-hmm. this is what I need, this is what you're gonna do for me. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, just little tips and tricks. Um, and then I have a, I have yeah. a website um, and then an Instagram page where I post a little bit about the kids as well. Um, mm-hmm. That's at Inclusion Inc, I-N-K with, um, the ink because I write a lot. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been it's been a fun um a fun journey and it's just kind of giving yeah. those creative juices I'm proud of a, you. a different mm-hmm. outlet, you know. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. Well, it's such invaluable information and I think it's like you said, taking all of those notes you have in your phone and putting them in just like a really comprehensive way for people is just so helpful. And also, I just think like what a cool way to honor your kids and right. everything that you've learned, too, of like, I don't know. I just I know they'll be so proud when they're when they can fully understand what you're doing with yeah. this work, too, of just like empowering other families to better um, provide inclusion for their kiddos and yeah. in the different atmospheres of their life and so what a cool way to honor your story and your kids and so I feel like we could talk for you for a hundred hours you're so fun to chat with (laughs) um and really your vulnerability and just honesty is really refreshing and super fun (laughs) um and so we just want to again thank you for um just being so vulnerable we also understand that to open up these parts of our stories again we don't do them on a daily basis so when we do it's kind of like oh wow i forgot about this (laughs) part of like my child's infancy and oh yeah that was really difficult and so we also just want to thank you for opening up that part of yourself again and just for the work that you're doing with inclusion inc we can't wait to see it take off and moms make sure to follow trish trisha and really just connect with those resources that she has and to any of the moms that are navigating the diagnosis or just a medical complex journey whether that's at infancy or 14 years of age we hope that Trisha's story is just a reminder that healing is a lifelong journey and you're doing the very best that you can um I think Asia said it earlier there's no rule book for how to perfectly do this journey of parenting especially adding on medical parenting and so just know that you are and always will be the best mother for your baby So we love you guys. We'll be back next week for another episode. But thank you again, Trisha, for being here with us. Thank you so much for listening to the Dear NICU Mama podcast. If you loved this episode, we'd be so grateful for a review. For more ways to connect with the Dear NICU Mama sisterhood, check out the links in the episode description. 